let us go through the life of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to learn a little bit more about him. Let's get a little bit more intimate with this great Prophet, the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Let us see what kind of a person he was and his relationship to us. And let me tell you something, mark my words. If you go through a problem in your life or you've been through a situation in your life and it got to a stage where you thought that there is no one suffering as much as you, always remember Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. If you've ever cried and your tears filled the ground and nobody was there to listen to your tears, remember Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. If you had a lost one, maybe you had a child that died, a parent that died, a sibling who died, a wife or husband who died, Remember Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He went through it all. If you have any type of problem, a sickness, an illness, someone bullied you, people attacked you, people abused you, people hurt you. Remember Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He went through more. He went through more. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala nabi ar-Rahmati wal huda Muhammadin sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We were looking at the birth, the most blessed birth, and that was the birth of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. When Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam was born, he did not have a father. His father Abdullah died before he was born. At the age of six, his mother Amina passed away, and he was shifted to his grandfather Abdul Muttalib. And at the age of eight, his grandfather also passed away. Abdul Muttalib dies. So they say we saw him, his hand on the coffin of Abdul Muttalib and tears rolling the blessed face uh, of the young boy. But before his death, upon his deathbed, Abdul Muttalib called Abu Talib and he put the Prophet in his care for two reasons. One is Abu Talib and Abdullah shared the same mother. And at the same time, they were very close to each other. Abdul Muttalib passed away, so the Prophet went to the house of Abu Talib. And Abu Talib was a loving uncle. The Prophet says about him, he says, he used to feed me in preference to his own children. You know, if there was limited food, he'd make sure I get to eat first before his children. And he stood behind the Prophet like a mountain. Abu Talib was a young uncle of his. And he had so many other children, he used to look after them. But he loved this little nephew. He loved him so much. Allah placed the love in the heart of the uncle. He didn't have much wealth. He watched the children as they ate. When the little children came to eat all his own children, they would all go and try and snatch the best of pieces of food and so on. And this young boy came, he sat, he waited, and he knew that what was apportioned for him, he would get it. So he waited and then he would take like an adult already from that age. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had this perfect upbringing for Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But perfect from which angle? Not from the angle of him having a father and a mother and so on and so forth. But his credentials were never dented from the very beginning. When Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was 12 years old, Abu Talib was getting ready to make a business trip up to Sham. Sham is the greater Syria area. And Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is about 12 years old at this time, young boy still. But he asks his uncle to allow him to accompany him on this journey. He was excited and he said, can I go with you? And Abu Talib, he doesn't think that this is a good idea. And he tries to convince him, no, let me go. You stay here in Mecca. And Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam starts to cry because he really wants it. He really wants to go with his uncle. So the Prophet ﷺ wanted to go. So Abu Talib decided to take him with himself on the strip. Abu Talib got the caravan organized. The Prophet ﷺ became part of this and they're going towards Sham. So the Rasul went and as you reach Busra, there there was a, a little monastery and a place where water used to gather, water body. 
So they used to call this Buhaira, you know, a little water body. And there was a monk that used to live in this monastery who they used to call the monk of the Buhaira. Over time, he became Bahira the monk. So the story is, the monk is sitting in his meditation or in his worship, in his monastery or temple or whatever was there as a structure. And he looks out and he notices a caravan coming. He noticed that there's a low laying cloud over this group. That if the caravan went to the right, the cloud went to the right. And if the caravan went to the left, the crowd went to the left. So Bahira, or the monk, you know, being a person busy in spiritual worship, and well, there's enough evidence to believe that the Christians were waiting for the coming of the next prophet. So he set up straight to kind of see, uh, you know, focus on this. And he watched them come to near the water body, near the oasis. And they camped or they put their luggage down near the tree there. When they sat under the tree, uh, the tree he noticed lowered its branches over them. So Bahira realized that whoever sitting there is a person of spiritual significance. So he looked in his monastery and he found that, you know, he has some provisions. So he sent word, oh men of Quraysh, you're invited to eat, break bread with me. And young and old and free men and bondsmen must come. So they said, we will come. At night they went and Bahira provided the food and he's scanning the faces. And he saw all ordinary people, so he turned to them and he said, Men of Quraysh, you've broken your word. They said, Why? He said, you, Everyone was supposed to come young and old and free men and bondsmen. Someone's not here. So they looked and they go, Oh, Muhammad, we've left him with the luggage. And they felt bad to themselves, especially Abu Talib. You know, this is the son of my brother and I have left him there. So he goes, uh, sent for him to bring him to the gathering and as he comes salawat rabbi wa salamuhu alayh ah this is the one the, the monk talked to him asked him certain questions and then uh, he saw the seal of prophethood between the shoulders of the rasul then he went to abu talib and he said who is this boy for you who is this boy in relation to you even though he was his nephew he used to call him my son because he treated him as a son. So when Buhaira asked Abu Talib, who is this boy to you? He said, he is my son. And then Buhaira was shocked and surprised. He was like, no, no, this boy, his father can't be alive. There is no way that the father of this boy is alive because amongst the descriptions of the, of the messenger that was to come was that he was an orphan. So when he asked Abu Talib again, tell me exactly who is he to you? He said, okay, yeah, he's actually, he's my nephew, but you know, he lives with me and I'm bringing him up. So he's like my son. So Buhaira was 100% convinced that this is the boy who is going to grow up to be the messenger, the prophet that they are all waiting for. So he tells Abu Talib, he says, do not take him to Asham because in Asham there are the Jews who when they see this boy, they are going to recognize him. Just like I recognize him, they're going to recognize him as well. Because they know his description in the Torah. They're going to know that he is the boy who is going to become the messenger of Allah. But once they realize that he is from the Arabs, that he is not from Bani Israel, once they realize that, they're not going to be happy. And they will kill him out of jealousy. So do not let him go to Asha. So Abu Talib hearing all of this, he gets very scared. So he decides, okay, I'm not going to take him to Asham. Abu Talib arranges for some of the people from the caravan to take Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam back into Makkah. So he didn't get to complete that journey to Asham. So we see here that the signs of the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they were there from his early childhood, from the beginning, even from his birth. And when he went back to Mecca, the signs that showed the fact that he was special, they continued and they got more and more and more. So Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam grew up in this house full of humbleness, humility. And he used to go out to look after the sheep and the goats. 
all the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala looked after these and some of the benefits were with animals you need so much patience because you can't even talk to them and thereafter humbleness humility because you've got to do so much and you are you are down to earth you, your clothes are messed sometimes you have to clean sometimes you walk over that which is unclean and so on and a lot of humbleness is also achieved by this over and above the patience and the humbleness there is dedication when one little animal is out away from the rest of the flock you find the shepherd will always make an effort to go and get it you don't just leave one and then you develop a link with these animals and even though you cannot communicate properly with them they understand you to a certain extent and you begin to understand them then you lose one you, one might die, a few might die, something might happen to one and the other one, something else might happen to it. One may be stolen and so on. All this is part of the training with full humbleness and humility. And the life of shepherds have things that the lives of non-shepherds don't have. They have time to reflect. The greatest learning happens on reflection, on thinking. You will see that, that each animal has its own distinct character. You know, one of them is violent, he will come and hit you with his horns when you're not watching. The other one is shy, he stays away. You get to look at it from outside uh, and kind of appreciate these different personalities and learn different ways of dealing with, with them, you know. For the harsh one, you might scold. For the nice one, you might hold. You get to learn personalities and to deal with them in a way without it affecting you too much. You know, shepherds, they're dealing with relatively gentle creatures, sheep. Sheep are pretty simple as well. And if you're not careful, protective, alert, aware, they could fall in harm. And that's an important feeling to learn when you're dealing with, uh, with your flock later on when you're a prophet. You know, working with different animals changes your character a little bit too. So for these reasons and for people management, crowd management, whatever, prophets are, are exposed to shepherding. So initially, his first job was he was a shepherd, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam from a young age alayhi salatu wa salam started to work and alayhi salatu wa salam started to earn a living. And one of the reasons that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam also did that which shows you the noble character of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is that he saw his uncle Abu Talib in a financial burden. So he didn't want to be an extra burden over his uncle. When Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was a, a young man and one of these days he was taking care of the sheep on the outskirts of Mecca. And the people of Mecca from time to time, they used to have different types of occasions and different celebrations. They used to have weddings and such. And in these parties, these wedding parties, a lot of bad stuff used to go on. Singing, dancing, all of these type of, of things. And the Prophet ﷺ never attended one of these things. He never saw it. He never witnessed it at all. He was protected by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his youth from attending the parties and so on that the youth used to attend. There is narration mentioned of one incident where he was with the flock of sheep that he was looking after and there was a wedding in the city. So he told his friend, look, please, can you look after this? I'm going out tonight. I need to attend a wedding. Or when he went there, there was a lot of wrong things happening, dance and so on with different types of beat of the drum and music and so on. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to protect Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So Allah made him yawn and made him sleepy. So he slept and he did not take part in it. So he had gone there, but he slept away. And the next day he went there and he slept. And he comes back to the shepherd and the shepherd says, but what did you do? He says, I did nothing. Then he realizes that this is protection of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then he promised saying, I will never ever attend any functions of this nature. Never. Subhanallah. May Allah strengthen us as well. Wallahi, if we want to correct our weddings in Islam as Muslims, and we want them to stop being functions of earning the pleasure of the devil, rather than earning the pleasure of Allah, all we need to do is don't go. That's it. If half the community don't go, everybody will change because they now know I must have a separate function. I must make sure that there is no music playing here and I must make sure that everything is Sharia compliant here because the community is not going to come. But we are collectively guilty of supporting such filth. And for that reason, a great act of worship known as Nikah 
an act of worship of the celebration of such a great act of worship, the walima, we attend it and our own girls and boys are dressed in a way that would be such an embarrassment. May Allah protect us. It's a fact. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala safeguard us. Do not compromise when it comes to nikah. Don't try and show people I had a bigger function and this function, simple function, even if you have invited just a head from all of the homes and that's it. Believe me, the more simple the function, the more blessed it is. Today, one of the reasons why divorce is almost 60% and marital problems are beyond 90% of marriages. Why? Because the seed we sowed was a seed of a cactus and then we expect apples. Allahu Akbar. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. Don't try and be proud to show people, hey, I've got a bigger wedding and this. No, you can have whatever size you want, but make sure it is compliant and it achieves the pleasure of Allah. That is the day of happiness. We want the marriage to work. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us all. So when he grew up to be a little bit older, he was about 20 years old, young man. And a very important event took place in Mecca. And this event is known as Harb al-Fijar. The word al-Fijar, it comes from al-Fujur. And Fujur means to do something evil, to do something that is wrong. So basically this war, it was between a tribe called Hawazin, which was a tribe from outside of Mecca, and between the Quraysh. And the Quraysh, of course, were from inside Mecca. So this war was between Hawazin and Quraysh. Now we know that there are four months that are considered the sacred months. Those are the months of Rajab, Dhul Qa'da, Dhul Hijjah, and Muharram. These are Al Ashhur Al Hurum, the sacred months. So, what does it mean? These months are sacred. It means it is not permissible to start fighting, to start a war during these four months. But if someone starts a war with you, then you are allowed, of course, to defend yourself. But the tribe of Hawazin, they decided that they would take advantage of the Quraysh's respect for these sacred months. So they attacked the Quraysh during Al Ashur Al Hurum, during the sacred months. And that is why it is called Harb Al Fijar, meaning to commit an act of evil. And who is the one who committed the act of evil? Al Hawazin. And it happened in the history of the Arabs five times. There were five instances of Harb al Fijar. And one of them happened during the time that the Prophet ﷺ was about 20 years old. So Hawazin, they attack Quraysh. And of course, Quraysh, they are defending themselves. So the Prophet ﷺ witnessed this battle with his own eyes and he participated with the Quraysh to some extent. He didn't actually fight. He didn't actually fight, but he would, he would give the arrows to his uncles. The uncles of the Prophet ﷺ, they were fighting. And the Prophet ﷺ was right there in the middle of the battlefield. And he would give the arrows to his uncles for his uncles to shoot. So, as we mentioned before, everything that happened in the life of the Prophet ﷺ, it happened for some wisdom that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decreed. And it was preparing him for something that would happen in the future. Like the fact that the Prophet ﷺ grew up as an orphan. He was an orphan. This prepared him later on in his life to show love and compassion to the orphans because he knew exactly what it's like to be an orphan. The Prophet ﷺ grew up in poverty. He lived a life of poverty from his childhood so that he would understand what the people who are poor are going through and he could deal with them on that type of a basis. And battle is one of the things, of course, that the Prophet ﷺ later on in his life he would be the commander of the military of the Muslims and he would be very successful in that role as well. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from the young age of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is showing him how these things work. So even though in Harb al-Fijar the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam didn't participate in terms of actually fighting, but he was right there in the middle of what was happening. He was giving the arrows to his uncles who were fighting. 
So he got a first hand experience of what it's like to be in a battle and what it's like to be in the middle of a war and how it works. So this was a an important event that took place in Mecca when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was about 20 years old. Also around this time, another great event happened in Mecca. Now Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he was young, he took part in several incidents, several great matters that occurred. One of them was known as Hilful Fudul. What is this incident about? During the early years of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, there was a pact called Hilf al fudul The story behind this pact is that a man from Zabid in Yemen, he came to Mecca for business. So he came from Yemen and we know Yemen is a distance from Mecca. He came for trade. What happened when he came for trade? His merchandise was sold to a man by the name of Al-As ibn Wa'il. This man promised to pay for the merchandise. He didn't pay immediately, but then he refused to pay and defaulted on payment. And he said he won't pay. So basically he usurped this merchandise. He oppressed this person, especially since he's a foreigner. He's a foreigner. What's he going to do? I'm with my people. I'm with my tribe. And this tribe comes from a clan that's well known. This person is a foreigner all the way from Yemen. What's he going to do? It's a win for me. This was wrong. But this is what he did. So this person here, this person that came from Zabid, Yemen, what did he do? He went and assumed a public platform. And this public platform was in the form of a mountain known as Jabal Abi Qubais. And he started yelling out on the top of his voice to the Quraysh. He started shouting, I am oppressed in your land. Are you people going to stand up for my rights or will you allow this oppression to take place in your land? And he spoke some emotional words. He spoke some emotional words. He basically yelled out a cry. So when this happened, people inquired what's going on. And it became apparent to the seniors that his property has been usurped. His merchandise has been taken unfairly. So what happened was a group, a group from the clans of the Quraysh, decided to come together. Banu Hashim, Zahra, Banu Taim, they came together. They had a meeting. They came together to meet. Let's discuss. Let's discuss this incident. And where did they meet? They met in the home of a person that was considered to be just. Now Muhammad Sallallahu was also invited as one of the members. And he was invited to witness this great treaty of human rights. What was it? It was known as Hilful Fudul, the pledge of the virtuous. What was the pledge of the virtuous? They agreed that we will all unite to help the one who is oppressed. That was the main treaty, the main point of that whole treaty. All of us will unite and we will help the one who is oppressed and we will challenge or fight the one who is the oppressor. Allahu Akbar. Later on, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, I attended a treaty, a covenant in the period of ignorance in the house of Abdullah ibn Jad'an. That was the house in which it occurred. If I was called to something similar to that today, I would go back and I would sign a similar treaty. Subhanallah. So they called this covenant in his house and they agreed. And then they went on to Al-As ibn Wa'il knocking his door. And when he flung the door open, he notices these five people and they asked him, where is the wealth of this Zabidi? He says, hang on, here it is. Amazing. Look at how powerful. So it needs us to unite against oppression. And the Prophet ﷺ from his infancy and childhood never ever worshipped idols. Never ever. Not once. And he always had something against these idols because it's just like Ibrahim ﷺ recognized at an early age. What's this thing here? It can't even help. He went to speak to those idols, Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam, and you know, no response. From that early age, he used to wonder. He used to think, 
all these things these people they are engaged in so much filth and activity that is really against the maker they worshiping sticks and stones they treating their women unfairly they are usurping wealth of people they are doing this and that and he used to try and think of solutions and he was always truthful honest although a lot of those around him used to have a few lies here and there may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us so he was known from an early age as as-sadiqul amin the truthful the trustworthy you could entrust him with anything he was known as that so this news began to spread and when it spread it got to the business people of makkah from amongst them was a woman her name was khadija bint khuwailid later to be known as radiyallahu anha may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us all and may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness from the seerah this is only a tip of the iceberg inshallah we hope that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala increases the love we have in our hearts for muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam in a way that it can be seen on our physical features and faces and in a way that inshallah will result ultimately in us earning jannah through obeying the instructions that were from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that came to us through muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam until we meet again to continue this episode we say wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabiyyina muhammad subhanallahi wa bihamdihi subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika nashhadu an la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk